Um, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, John was instructed by a voice to write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And so this morning, Lord willing, we want to look together at those seven churches <laughs> as John is given this vision on the island of Patmos in his exile there, Jesus comes to him to reveal that. So I'd like for us to read together the first 11 verses of the second chapter this time, as we're gonna cover the first two of those churches in our reading here this morning. So if you'll respond with the yellow print, Revelation chapter two, verses one through 11. <clears throat> to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of the, its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt, by the second death. So, um, we had Jesus explaining that this one that John saw walking among the lampstands has the seven stars in his hands and he explained that to us at the very end of chapter one. Now we move into chapters two and three. And what I'd like to do is overview those two chapters today. And I'd like to ask you this question as we sort of engage this. What do you think is the main thing that Jesus would say to a church. Mm. <clears throat> what is his top priority? What would he say is the primary thing that a church ought to accomplish? To follow him. To follow him? Okay. I think that's very important. Love for one another. Love for one another. All right. Jesus did say, this is a new commandment that I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. To love him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, everything. Okay, this is the first commandment, to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength. It's the foundation for everything. Okay, good. Stay true to the gospel. Pardon me? Stay true. Stay true to the gospel, okay. Sure. To be a light to the world. Be a light to the world, okay. There's a lot of things that stand out to us, right, in the, in the, New Testament, the teachings of Jesus and of the Apostle Paul. What's really interesting, I think, is to look at the churches that Jesus spoke to at, at this point at the end of the first century. So Jesus is pictured as standing among the lampstands. He said the lampstands are the churches and the stars in his hand are the angels of the churches. And so Jesus speaks to them from this position. So, what I'd like to do is to look, first of all, at the salutations in these letters. It begins to the angel of the church at Ephesus. And so, each one of the letters begins that way. 
right, to the angel of the church of, and then it fills in the name. And so that's how he begins, the angel of the church. It's written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Asia, it's called in the scriptures. And we looked at that last week as we looked at these seven churches. They form a kind of circle. It starts with Ephesus to Smyrna, Pergamum, kind of circles around. And we highlighted the fact that um, these seven churches are representative of a lot of other churches. Because there's a church at Heropolis that's mentioned in the New Testament in Paul's letters. The church of Colossae is mentioned. There's a church at Miletus that's mentioned. There is a church at Troas that's mentioned. Uh, of course, we have over here um, Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and so forth. And then there are churches over here, Antioch, Iconium, and so on. So Jesus picks seven churches to write to. And he writes to the angel of the church. Angel, as you probably know, is the Greek word angelos. And um, you can read it here in either English or in Greek, if you can read the Greek. And it basically means messenger. And so what's really interesting here is whether angel, in this case, means a heavenly messenger, that is, the angels who come and go from the presence of God, like Gabriel did when he brought a message to Zacharias or to Mary regarding the birth of John and Jesus, or whether angel is a reference to the bishop or a human messenger. Uh, you have the possibility in each case as we deal with church here. So it's something that um, interpreters wrestle with, um, expositors wrestle with what this means. Um, this word angel is used as a human messenger um, some seven times in the, in the New Testament, which is really interesting. Um, Here's a here's a an indication of that. In Luke chapter seven, we read, "When the messengers of John had left," and a couple of verses before that, it clearly says that John sent some of his disciples to Jesus to ask the question, "Are you the one, or should we look for someone else?" So John the Baptist was was struggling because he he thought he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but where is he? Where's John? He's in jail. He's in jail, right? And he's not being released. Jesus is performing these miracles, but John's not being released. And so he write, he sends some of his disciples, and it's very clear that these are human messengers. In two places, John himself is called the messenger, the angelos in this process. So if it's a heavenly angel, that Jesus is addressing. The question is, why write a letter? Right? Why would you write a letter to the angel? Jesus talks to the angels many places in the book of Revelation and other places. So why write a letter to the angel who was assigned to the church at Ephesus? Or to the angel who's assigned to Smyrna? Because, and so, he, just because he just told me to. Talk to whatever you want. Okay, <laughs> true. And, the, and that's part of the answer is that Jesus said... To, to speak this to the angel. There's another problem, however, and that is how can he be guilty? Because he says, I have this against you. So now Jesus is saying, I have something against the angel of the church at Ephesus. Because when you read through these verses that we read, and I'll point it out to you when we come back to the screen in a minute, the you is singular. So, to the, church, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, you can transfer the you from the angel to the church, but the text doesn't do that, right? The text continues in this context of dealing with the angel. And so then that raises a question, what does this say about each local church? So, if it's a heavenly angel, does Coastal Christian have an angel that's here with us every Sunday morning? Oh, you get points for that, Gary. Uh, I, 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 he says, do we have an angel at Coastal Christian? like, yes, we do. Uh, I, I, 
believe that there are angels that meet with us. Not just on this verse, but on the basis of 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul says that the people who, who worship in the church are to do certain things and so forth for the sake of the angels. So I think there are angels who are watching how we live, how we worship, how we relate to one another. So these churches in Revelation, if it's a, if it's a heavenly angel, they each have an angel attached to them. To me, there are some problems with this interpretation. Primarily because why would he write a letter to them when he could just say, hey guys, I have you here in my hand, you seven angels, and I need to talk to you, right? But he writes this letter to them, so he has John write it down, send it to the church in order for the angel to write it, uh, to read it rather. Maybe. Maybe it was for proof. Pardon me? All right, you got it written down instead of going out of the mouth. You think it was for proof? That he wanted proof. Okay, there's another possibility. And that is if we have a human angel, then we have an individual who is the leader of each church. And then the question is, well, what does this say about local churches? Because normally we, we tend to think in terms of elders in a church. But in each case, it's an angel singular in each church. And so if it's a human angel, which would make sense if he's writing a letter, and if he is corrective in some ways, then that says that each of these churches had a singular leader at this time in history. What's the date? The date is around 95, 96 AD. And so Jesus is writing to these seven churches, and as he writes to them, he writes to the human messenger. We would call it the pastor today. It's, the, it's, it's a reference, I think, to the overseer, if that's what's intended here, as opposed to elders. And so that raises the question, what is the role of elder versus overseer, of pastor, and so on? In my judgment, this is part of the biblical argument in favor of the singular leadership. That is, one person who is invested with responsibility for the local church. And that's reinforced by Jesus without him making a big deal out of it. When he writes to the angel of each church. Now, you have to decide. You can read the text and you can say, no, this is a reference to a, a heavenly angel. <clears throat> there is an angel assigned to each church. And either way, uh, you make that decision. John MacArthur agrees with you according to my study Bible. Okay. You got him behind you. He wrote to me and asked me what to put in there. And it could be both. It could can't be, be both. It can't. Uh -uh. No. When you interpret, uh, this is my opinion, when you interpret something in scripture, it has to mean one thing. It can't mean two or three things, the same word or the same phrase. That gets us into all kinds of interpretive problems in other places. So you can't say, well, it means this and it means this. Right. Right. Uh, we wouldn't do that with one another when we communicate. So, Sometimes we beg off if we say something out of line and somebody confronts us and we say, well, that's not what I meant, what I meant was, uh -huh. and we beg off. But that's not clear communication when you do that. And so the Bible is written to be clear in its communication. I think it has to be one meaning. Amen. All right? Okay, so... Then, in, the, in each address, we have a description of Jesus. And if Jesus is saying this, which it appears that he is, then these are self-descriptions, right? And it's unique to each church. Here we have the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the golden lampstands. So when he writes to Ephesus, he emphasizes his role as this one among the lampstands. So in each church, when he writes, he describes himself a little differently. So here's Ephesus, here's Smyrna. When he writes to Smyrna, he says, the one who was the first and the last, who was dead and who's come to life. When he writes to Pergamum, he says, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. When he writes to Thyatira, he says, eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like burnished bronze. Now, these are picking up things from the description of him at the beginning of the chapter, for the most part. 
But for some reason, Jesus is emphasizing different aspects of his uh, visage, of his nature, as he writes to each church. When you get to Sardis, it's the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So seven spirits, we saw back in chapter 1 as a reference to the Holy Spirit. Um, to Philadelphia, he says, the one who is writing here is the one who is holy, who is true as the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. And so now he departs a little bit from the picture before, but he's describing something about himself. Dan? With his description uh, coincide with the tent of the churches? I think so. Yeah. I think that's where this is going. In each case, he, he uses some particular aspect of his nature or his person as he addresses the angel of that church. And then Laodicea, <clears throat> he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So, you have Jesus manifesting himself as he writes to each church in a slightly different way. And that becomes part of the interpretive process in terms of, well, what is he saying to Sardis? Or what is he saying to Philadelphia? And so on. And so that's, that's uh, how we work with that sum. Secondly, after the salutations, there are the communications. There's the message, the heart of the message, or the heart of the letter to each church. In, in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds, your toil, and your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and so on. So he describes something about each church. And in every letter, there's a commendation. There's a positive statement, except for one of them. Um, and in each case, he highlights something that they have accomplished. In many cases, it has to do with deeds. I know your deeds. Yeah. Which is really interesting, yeah. because we want to highlight relationships. And what he highlights in several of these letters is deeds. The deeds with, which have been done in that church. And so Jesus is keeping track of those things. It doesn't diminish relationships. It just simply says that he knows what they have accomplished. He knows the toil and perseverance. He knows the difficulties they've been through. He knows in this case that they um, cannot tolerate evil men, but they, they test the people who want to be the teachers and preachers in their midst. And so we would call Ephesus a really fine church in terms of its programs and its, um, its doctrine and its, um, its establishment and so forth. All right? um, secondly, there's a confrontation in each letter. In some way, Jesus confronts the individual church or the leader of that church for something that needs correction or adjustment. He says, but I have this against you that you left your first love. And then there's an admonition in each case for corrective actions. And so Jesus provides instruction for them in the process. All right, here's, here's uh, let me back up. Here's Ephesus. This is the commendation. This is the positive statement, and you can identify that in each letter as you go through. And then there's a confrontation. But I have this against you, that you left your first love. And then there's the admonition for corrective action. And basically what he says to Ephesus is, remember what was there before. Repent and repeat. So it becomes a, a message to a church and perhaps a church like ours to remember from where we have fallen, remember and to repent of any things that we have done where we might have left our first love and then repeat those things. And he says, or else I'm coming and I will remove the lampstand from this place. And then he adds, yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So you have this structure. All right, commendation, confrontation, and an admonition to them, and that's true for each of the letters. Now, I'm not going to take time this morning to go through all of them. We would um, we'd be spending months here <coughs> if we did that. But with Ephesus, the, 
the confrontation is on the fact that she has left her first love. So they have everything right in what they do, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Okay, that's Ephesus. Then you get to Smyrna, and Smyrna is suffering big time, and it's going to get worse, Jesus says. So great persecution in the church at Smyrna, especially in their case at the hands of false Jews. He says, they call themselves Jews, but they're really a synagogue of Satan. Pergamum is compromise. When you read through Pergamum, um, Pergamum, the name Pergamum means the confluence of two rivers, which is interesting. Um, and the church at Pergamum is beset with compromise. They have, they have tolerated things in their midst that they ought not to be tolerating, Jesus says. And so when you look at the, the commendation and then the confrontation. Thyatira is guilty of personal contamination. In this church, the people have become contaminated with the things of the world. And so the leaders of the church and apparently the angel of the church is guilty of contamination. So the church has drifted away from its purpose and has begun to be more political, begun to be more um, engaged in the things of the world and so forth, rather than being true to the original calling of Jesus. And so Thyatira is usually associated with personal contamination. Sardis is a church that Jesus says, you have, you have the statement that you're alive, but you're really dead. All right? Some of you are familiar with that. So here we have a spiritually dead church. Years ago, I was pastoring in another state, and we had a church nearby. And um, when I talked to people from that church, there were three or four that I could identify who were genuine believers. But most of them were not believers at all. And there are a lot of churches that have the name church on the shingle. But they're not really spiritually alive at all. They're engaged in social gospel, they're engaged in doing good works in the community, they're engaged in self-perpetuation, all sorts of things to keep that organization alive, but they're not really spiritually alive. And so Jesus says to them, wake up and get moving, all right? Get back where you need to be. The Church of Philadelphia is the only one that does not have a negative statement, and Jesus describes that as a struggling but positive ministry. He says, you're strong, you're small rather, and you're struggling, but I'm the one who has placed an open door before you, and nobody can shut that door. So keep plugging, keep serving, keep moving as you, um, as you serve me. And so Jesus sees that as struggling but positive. And of course, most of us are familiar with Laodicea, this lukewarm. They're hot and cold. And so some weeks they're excited about Jesus and other weeks they're not. And that is um, disappointing to Jesus. So as he writes to these seven churches, it's with these kinds of things in mind. And he describes himself uniquely to each church. And then he provides a, um, a prescription for them as well. I take it that these churches are selected by Jesus out of at least that many more, and perhaps a lot more, in the area that he could have picked. But they're designed to be selected because they're typical of the problems that occur in churches since that day all the way down to the present. Most of us can probably find in our community churches like Sardis, where there are maybe some true believers in them, but for the most part, there's just no real interest in the gospel, not really spiritual life, and so on. Um, in some ways, we're a little bit like Philadelphia, right? We're struggling. We're, we're working to regain our footing and to, and to continue to move ahead, and God has put an open door in front of us. Uh, there are churches that are compromised. There are churches in parts of the world that are going through severe persecution, and so on. And so that ebbs and flows, and it's possible that any given church can have two or three of these situations, I think. 
um, present at the same time, maybe. So Jesus is describing uh, the churches, uh, seven of them here in Asia Minor. That leads us then to the exhortations from Jesus. And exhortations, in my judgment, fall into two categories. First, uh, he who has an ear. He says in each one of the letters, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right? So Jesus is seeking those who listen. That should be um, important for us. Jesus is looking for people who have their ears tuned to the Holy Spirit. He says, um, the Spirit is the one who provides instruction. That's interesting, because Jesus is speaking to the angel of the church, and he says to that angel and to the church, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so Jesus is present in the midst of the churches, but the Spirit of God is also present. And the Spirit of God is the one who provides, apparently, the um, daily instruction and so forth for the people who are part of that church. And then, in each case, he also says, he who overcomes. He who overcomes. There are blessings and rewards that are promised. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, in the case of, um, of Ephesus. And so these blessings and rewards are promised, and they're a little different for each church. Which creates an interesting study in itself. Um, I think David Jeremiah has just recently published a book called The Overcomers, which he takes this and develops this, and you might be interested in, in following up on that uh, with his book, very good, by the way. Um, so we have all these statements about what's going to happen to those who overcome. Uh, in Smyrna, those who overcome will not be hurt by the second death. There's going to be severe persecution in Smyrna, but you won't be hurt by the second death. In Pergamum, I will give some of the hidden manna a white stone for compromise, all right? For being um, conformed to this world, Jesus says, those who overcome that temptation, I will give authority over the nations. Instead of compromising and, and becoming part of the world system, anticipate that Jesus is going to give authority over that world system. In Sardis, um, the church that's dead, Jesus says, you say you're alive, but I say you're dead. You will, if you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garments, and I'll not erase the name from the book of life. One of the problems with this, of course, is are there people whose name will be erased from the book of life? And I don't think that's going to happen. That's another study in itself. Uh, so there's some of these statements that are uh, very interesting and a little puzzling as we walk through it. So, here's the bottom line. Jesus is standing in the midst of the churches. And I think that's still true today. He still walks among the churches. He is present. The churches belong to him, <clears throat> right? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it's Jesus' church, and each one of these lampstands each one of the churches belongs to him. So he has the right to make that kind of a statement. I think, if you put it all together, what he's saying is that overcoming trials is exhorted by the ever-present Jesus. Now, that's not to diminish other things that are important, some of the things that we identified here this morning. But in the book of Revelation, as Jesus addresses the churches, the, the common message to each of them is overcome your trials. It's interesting that he doesn't say very much about loving one another. That's in the scriptures, and I don't want to deny that at all. That becomes very important. But the overwhelming message is to overcome. Whatever your situation is, to overcome those circumstances as you live in the light of Jesus who moves in and around our churches. So what? Number one, I think we need to worship and relate to one another um, as though Jesus were present. Because guess what? He is present, right? And so if you get ticked off at somebody in the church, Jesus is watching, right? He's moving in the midst of the churches. 
And so we need to worship and relate to one another with the viewpoint that Jesus is present himself in our midst. Secondly, to overcome your trials with the Spirit's help. Do you have trials, difficulties? Yeah, you do. Um, Job says man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Right? It's a part of life that we're going to go through trials. They differ from church to church. But the message here is that Jesus is anticipating that we will overcome even as he overcame. So we have his help, we have the spirit, we have the truth of God's word, and Jesus says, overcome your trials. And then thirdly, to anticipate the, the heavenly rewards. Depending on what you're going through, go to these different churches and focus on the promises that Jesus has made to those who overcome. He's going to set you up to rule. He's going to, he's going to feed you with hidden manna. He's promised that the second death cannot harm you, etc., etc. And so we focus on these statements Jesus promises to overcomers as a way of helping us overcome what we experience in our lives. Comments? Do you ever wonder? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like right to the church at Coastal? Yeah. I think he was saying, great job. Go for it. I, I'm not sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to exercise. Go to it. Not partial at all. <laughs> but it'd be a good exercise to go through on a regular basis. Hey, what would he say? Like, as yeah. we reflect back on the past year or whatever it is. Yeah. I think we've been through a lot. So, in some ways, we're kind of like Philadelphia. In some ways, we're a little bit like Smyrna. Maybe there's other other things there as well with, that we experience. I had a co-worker this week that had a really rough week. She's a Christian girl, and she is starting to get very upset and vent. And I said, do you see who's sitting next to you? And she's who's with you? And she goes, you know who's sitting next to me. And I said, yes, there is. It's Jesus. <laughs> so I said, you know how to act. I think it's helpful for us sometimes to picture Jesus alongside of us with wherever we are, whatever we're, we're dealing with, because because it helps us. He's not physically present, but he is present. And it just helps us to identify that way. The great mystery. Yeah. Christ in us, the hope of the world. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, these letters to the churches. Thank you for giving us at least a brief glimpse this morning of the heart of Jesus for his people. In every case, he knows what they were going through, and he knows what we're going through. And he has the message for us through his spirit, and in some cases directly from him, as to what we need. Help us as we walk with you. Help us to be those who um, truly honor you, and not get wrapped up in some of these problems that these churches experience. May we be faithful servants until the day you call us home, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you.